All right, everybody, good evening. Happy Monday to you. That feels a little weird to say. Let's make sure that uh, everybody can see and hear me okay before we go, before we get going any further. I've got the uh, chat up and going, so pardon my eyes as they dart all over the place. I just have to keep an eye on everything. I'm a one-man show here. Everybody knows that. All right, there we go. Sound and picture quality is great from Dave Stanchewski. Great. A lot of Army members on here. Bill Gerlach, Mike Anderson, Byron Beverd, Jeff Kinney, Captain Crow saying Lima Charlie loud and clear. There we go. All right. So it sounds like everything is up and running. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Hour, or I'm sorry, not one hour, one day later than normal. But I had some things to do last night that I wanted to do and so I took a night off. It's my channel. I can do what I want, you know, and I'm retired, so I can definitely do what I want. Mark Pearson is here. Dan Cannon, and Patrick Forrester, all Army members. Also, Jim Dombrowski, Hugh Merrill. Man, all the Army guys around here. So if you want to join the Tangle Tackle Army and uh, get your name highlighted in green like that, the link is right down in the description. Feel free to check it out. I appreciate everybody that does that. So let's get into this we got a good show tonight. My name is Chris. I run Dark Blue Charters here in Manistee, Michigan, as well as the YouTube channel here. Um, we do this every Sunday night at 7 p.m. We try to do like a seminar every Sunday night on a different topic. Some nights we don't have seminars. Some nights I have guests. We talk about other things. And some nights we just, uh, we just hang out. So if you're new here, I really appreciate you being here. And for everybody that's been here a long time, thank you very much as well. And if you're new here, make sure to check out the poll question. I'm going to do that right now. We try to put a poll up every Sunday. This week's poll, I have been salmon fishing for my first year, two to five years, five to ten years, or more than ten years. And uh, I like the honesty here. There's some, there's some people out there, you know, they'll tell you, I've been fishing for 50 years out there, and it's like their third one. But uh, I like the honesty. A lot of people on here, 6% of the 115 votes are saying this is your first year. Hey, welcome to welcome to a great, great <laughs> wallet emptying, time consuming passion that you will have for a long, long time. This is a great, great sport. And once you hook into one of those kings, you understand why, why I gave up bass fishing so many years ago. These things are freight trains on steroids. They're so much fun to catch. But... Uh, the leader on that, more than 10 years at 45%. And then two to five years at 32%, five to 10 at 16 and 6%, like I said, at your first year. Well, welcome aboard. I'm glad you found the channel. I hope we were able to help you out in some way. And if you join the Tangle Tackle Army, you get access to our private Discord room where we talk fishing on pretty much a daily basis. And uh, I'm doing something... With that Discord that I'm finding pretty fun, I'm bringing on some industry people uh, like Scott Argett Singer from Dreamweaver Lures. And don't forget that these, these podcasts, these live streams are all proudly brought to you by Dreamweaver Lures. Check them out at dreamweaverlures.com. But Scott Argett Singer is now a member. He's a mod moderator on that uh, Discord. Leroy Dowding is also signing up for Purple Taco Fly Supply. I'm going to see who else I can get to come on there. Um, I'd like to see if I can get Big John to come on there. I'd like to see if I can get uh, Moonshine Lures to come on. It just uh, It's fun to get on there and chat and talk fishing and talk tactics. And uh, there's a place you can buy, sell, trade. There's a place where you can talk ice fishing, hunting. Um, you name it, it's there. River fishing, it's there. So it's pretty cool. Anyway, let's go through a couple of housekeeping things, and then we'll get into into tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is divers. Dipsy divers, deeper divers, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's funny, a dipsy diver is a lure Jensen, and that everybody calls divers dipsy divers, but that's just uh, that is that brand's name for them, but uh, Dreamweaver calls them deeper divers. These are my go-to. So but no matter what name you call it, however you call it, they do the same thing. We'll, call it, we'll talk about that all tonight. <clears throat> and excuse me, I have a little frog in the throat tonight. I don't know what's going on. I think I'm fine. Um, yeah, so excuse me if I have to drink some water and clear my throat every now and then. But anyway, let's jump into this. So a couple 
couple of housekeeping things. I'm watching for the cat because the shop cat is in here someplace. And he's already been eyeing up my equipment. I have, you probably noticed over the last few weeks, the uh, I, I've increased the standard of these live streams. I have all new equipment, mobile equipment, where I can go anywhere and, and produce this, uh, this type of thing. And uh, the cat loves eyeing this thing up. I mean, he's looking at my brand new laptop like he wants to knock it off this uh, stand every two minutes. But I don't see him right now, but uh, I'm sure he'll sneak up here before too long. All right, fly contest, fly time contest for Purple Taco Fly Supply. Um, if you remember right, you can go back and search for the video if you want to. We are searching for five new flies for the 2023 season to go into the Purple Taco Fly Supply catalog, which means I'd like you to send your flies, your entries into the shop here at Tangle Tackle. Somebody's calling me on my phone. Better make sure it's not important. Nope, we'll get that later. Um, so send your fly into the shop. We've had several come in already. We're going to take a look at those. Myself, a few other charter guys, the guys here at the shop. We will pick out what we think are the five best ones. If you're chosen, your fly will go into the Purple Taco catalog along with your name and the name that you choose for that fly, along with a $50 gift certificate to Purple Taco Fly Supply. Um, so yeah, you can uh, get some more fly time stuff and come up with other great creations. So please send those flies in. I've heard people say, man, I don't want, I've got some, but I don't want to send them in because I don't know if they're going to be good enough for this whole con. Trust me, they're good enough. Send them in. I want to see them, please. Uh, we're going to do this probably from now on. Purple Taco has about 30 or 40 of my recipes on their website. And uh, I'd like to start implementing, getting new stuff in there new stuff, new things that I can't think of and other people can. So please send them in. We would love to see them for the contest. <clears throat> also, Mike F., good to see you. Terry Bradshaw, K-Dog USMC, good to see you also. Jam Pollock here, good to see you also. So if you watched Scott Argetsinger and I, uh, we did a, uh, a real a drag upgrade on a reel not too long ago. We've done two now, one for a line counter and one for a non-line counter. If you watched the one with the line counter, you saw at the end that we are going to give away that reel that we upgraded right there. That's the one. We're going to give this away to somebody that either supports the channel on Patreon or in the Tangle Tackle Army. We will do that in a few weeks. But this is a really nice Akuma Convector 45D. Great for, uh, great for a wire diver right there. With the drag upgrade, the carbon fiber drag upgrade. So somebody is going to win that reel here in a few weeks. Congratulations to whoever that is. We also, let's talk about the Steelhead Challenge because I'm getting a few emails on that. The Steelhead Challenge started a couple months ago when I went through the shop here and I picked out all the gear that I needed to go out and fish the river for a steelhead. And the river here in, in Manistee County is the Big Manistee River or the Little Manistee. There's a few other tributaries around as well. But uh, those are the biggest ones around. Well, the uh, Bear Creek's there as well. But anyway, I went through the shop and I picked out everything that I needed for less than $100. It was almost right on that $100 mark. So since then, I've been going out and walking the banks. I've been trying to catch a steelhead. Um, I've got a lot of good footage on that. I'm not going to tell you if I've been successful or I have not been successful. I'll have that footage out here in a couple of weeks. And then I'm going to give away that whole rod and reel combo along with some other gear to somebody on the Tangle Tackle Army or on Patreon as well. So somebody's going to win that also. So that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm actually going to jump on a boat this weekend as well with a good friend of mine. I'll put that into the video also and we'll see how we do. But anyway, I've been having a lot of fun with that. I'm not going to be, I'm going to be honest. Fishing has been tough. It's been tough on the banks. I've seen a few boats out there next to me uh, that have been successful. And again, I'm not going to tell you if I've been successful or not. You'll have to wait and check it out on the video, but that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a good one. Also, that's about it on the, uh, the housekeeping stuff. Let's talk about the fishing report around here. And then we'll again get into the topic of the week. But first off, the fishing report. You don't see that every day. All 
right, so the fishing report here in Manistee. I think everybody knows ice is done. If you're still going out on the ice around here, Godspeed, because it is shady all around here. Please don't be that person. I mean, it's it's bad, bad right now. So let's just get past the ice. Let's jump into some more relevant things. Pier fishing has been pretty good. Some steelhead coming in, some brown showing up, uh, some lake trout showing up. So guys out on the pier have been chucking everything from spa uh, spawn bags out there. Again, to small silver and green, silver and blue uh, spoons as well. Talked to one guy that's actually uh, tossing hot tots out there also, said he had a little success. So found that pretty interesting. So if you're looking to get out on your local piers, go ahead and do so. Get yourself a nice 9, 10-foot rod, 8-foot rod. The longer rod's a little better. A nice long-handled net because you're going to need that. And head on out there. You sh we should be getting more steelhead coming in. Well, they should be coming in more and more um, any day now because their run has got to start here pretty darn soon if it has really started trickling in already. <clears throat> surf fishing, I've seen a few guys out surf fishing, so I imagine the same thing is going on out there. I haven't talked to anybody, <coughs> so I don't know how, how successful they've been. Excuse me a moment. Uh, but I have seen quite a few guys out around the, uh, the beaches. On the way in tonight to the shop, I was driving down a road that goes right along Lake Michigan, and I swear I saw a boat out on the shelf. And I don't know if that were my eye; those were my eyes tricking me or not. Very well could have been a boat out there, but I've heard of other guys taking their boats out, running the shorelines lately, and some have been doing some decent brown fishing, which is really good news to me, because brown fishing around here has not been that good over the last few years. I would love to see those numbers start to come back. I saw something today from the Michigan Chart Boat Association that missed, or, uh, about the stocking numbers and the brown numbers, I believe on the Michigan side, I believe they were planning 250,000. And it sounds like Wisconsin was maybe planning about 300,000. But uh, that's good news that we're getting some, maybe some fresh browns into the system. Chinook numbers and coho numbers all look good as well as, as, well as steelhead numbers. So more stocking is being implemented into the Michigan side, which I think is a good thing. From what I've seen over the last couple of years, I think the uh, the bait fish out there can definitely handle it now. I don't think we're going to crash the system like we almost did not too awful long ago, which would have been devastating, absolutely devastating. So good to see those stocking numbers go up. River fishing, like I said, it's been pretty tough. For me, at least, uh, I've heard I've heard some boats out there doing decent numbers. Yeah, decent numbers could mean anything from three fish up to six, seven, eight fish, maybe even more. Uh, a friend of mine that runs Blue Collar Outdoors put a beautiful twenty-pound steelhead in the boat just last week. He uh, he runs a pretty good boat, and he's one of the few around here that I would recommend for a river trip. Riverside is outstanding. Net Miner is outstanding. Steelhead Hunter is outstanding. Blue Collar Outdoors, another really good boat. So if you're looking to get out on the river, try looking up one of those guys, see if you can get out there and go for it. It's the time to go right now. Uh, Bob Hunter asking any word on the consent decree. No, Bob, nothing has changed too much. Uh, it's pretty much still tied up in the courts. Looks like mid-April to the end of April, we might have some fresh words. So when something like that comes out, I'll get you some more information. Chad Capula, uh, wishing me well, on, or saying uh, congrats on the retirement. Thanks, Chad. That was from my real, I'm still charter fishing. That was from my full-time job, so I do appreciate that. Dennis S. is asking, what strain of Browns in Wisconsin? Dennis, I don't have that information. Sorry. Uh, what else do I want to say on fishing? River fishing, like I said, it's been a mix. <laughs> One boat I talked to said he hasn't run a jig with a waxworm all season. It's been all beads and doing well. Another boat I talked to said it's been all jigs and waxworms. Another boat said plugs have been doing well. So really, that tells me that uh, just get out there and go for it, no matter what presentation you might have. Uh, I've been running mostly beads lately, mostly beads and a few jigs. So, And uh, that seems to be the norm right about now. All right. So that is the fishing report. If you got any questions on that, just hold it to the end of the video, please. We'll answer questions then. And that reminds me, please, 
If you have any questions about the topic of the week, please wait until the end of the video because while I'm up here running my mouth, I'm not going to be able to read comments and, and respond to them in real time. So what we do on this is once we're done giving the presentation, uh, we'll go to the end credits and you're still able to use the chat section to be able to ask questions. So stick around for that at the end. If your question doesn't get answered in some way, stick around to the end. I try to catch up with everybody then. And uh, I always try to go back and read all the comments after this thing posts to YouTube. All right. Anyway, let's get into the topic of the week. Man, we got 180 people here almost. That's great. On a Monday night, I didn't know if we'd get 20. So thanks, everybody, for being here. But let's jump into the topic of the week, and we'll go from there. There we go. Make sure I got everything running here correctly. Okay, great. All right, I got my notebook right here because I go. I work better when I write things down because it helps me remember things. In my advanced age, <laughs> early 50s, I forget a few things every now and then. All right, let's talk about divers. Let's talk about how we fish divers. We'll talk about the basics all the way up to some advanced techniques. And uh, hopefully it'll help everybody out uh, that's brand new to the sport. If you're old hat on divers, I'm glad you're here because you can help answer questions that I can't. You know, when I'm not looking at the screen, whoops. Sorry about that, bumped the wrong button. But uh, if you are here and have a ton of experience on divers, thanks for being here. I am glad uh, that uh, that I have you here to, to run as backup. Anyway, I see, I gotta be careful when I'm setting things down on the laptop because of bump buttons. Let's talk about divers. What are they and what do they do? So let's take a look at a diver right now. <clears throat> this is a Dreamweaver Deeper Diver. This is the 107 millimeter size, or the number four, I believe they call it. Yep, size number four. This is the diver that I typically use as a high diver. Other people call it outside divers. High diver or outside diver. So this is my more shallow running diver, even though that the high diver, low diver, is pretty much a misnomer because a lot of times my divers, my high diver and my low diver, are only, they're only a few feet apart as far as depth. But depending on what setting they're on, there's going to be a greater spread between them. So just because something says high diver, low diver, doesn't mean that this thing always has to be shallower than a low diver. Hope that makes sense to everybody. But let's pop this open. We'll take a look at it. And then we'll get into some more specifics. There we go, Dreamweaver number four, 107 millimeter diver. This is in black, and we'll talk about colors here shortly because that's a uh, that is a highly <laughs> uh, debated question when it comes to divers and what colors people like to run. Anyway, nice good hard plastic on the back. You will find a ring with different settings available. You can turn that around. You'll see an arrow right up here on top, and depending on where you turn that around is going to be what setting. It is on. On the front, you will see an arm, which folds back into a locked position when ready. And that is adjustable by a small screw right there. Off the back, this is the back. You will see a nice S-clip along with a barrel swivel. And that goes to your leader, which goes back to whatever lure you want. So that is a diver in a nutshell. We'll get into more of the nuts and bolts on this in just a moment. All right. First off, I want to talk about how are we fishing these? What kind of rods and reels we're going to run these things on? Pardon me for a second. So rods and reels. The most typical size reels I see out there are the 30 size or the 40 size or 45 size. Everybody, every reel manufacturer pretty much has a 30, a 40, in a 50 size, no matter what number they call it, 35, 45, 55, they really come in those numbers. There's 20s as well, um, there's 10s even. But for divers, it's normally gonna be a 30 size or 40 size. These two right here are excellent choices for diver applications. These are the Akuma Coldwater series. These have good drags in them to begin with. 
the Akuma cold water, like I showed a little while ago. Oh, sorry. Not cold water, but convector. The 45D. This has a decent drag system in it, but I would recommend if you're going to use a cold water reel for a diver application that you upgrade the drags in here. And you can do them yourself. Watch that video that Scott and I put out there. <coughs> or you can send them to my buddy Scott and he will do them for you. So I recommend that. <coughs> People talk about, you know, large capacity diver reels. And I'm going to be completely honest. The diver reels that I run on my boat are size 50. They're Daiwa Saltist size 50 line counters. And one thing you're going to want to make sure to have, no matter what reel you go with, make sure it does have a line counter on it because that's going to give you your depth. It's going to let you know how deep that diver is most likely running. So my reels, like I said, are Daiwa 50 size. I like the extra capacity. I like the little extra cranking power it gives me. Uh, I love the Dio Saltus for their drag systems. I think they're fantastic. It's really the only reel out there you do not have to change the drags out on to get better performance. So that is the reels that I use. And again, doesn't mean that that's a reel that you have to use. Anybody that goes around and says, this is the way you have to do something is full of it. Because they probably learned that from somebody else, who learned it from somebody else, who learned it from somebody else. And that 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 old saying is, hey, you got to do it this way. It's just not true. There's many different ways to do things when it comes to fishing. Not just salmon fishing, but walleye fishing, bass fishing, everything else. Just because everybody says in some form, some place, that this is the way you got to do it, don't believe it. I love my size 50s for my diver setups. The other thing that I hear a lot of people talk about is speed on a diver reel. I've heard so many people say you can't go high speed on a diver reel. Well, that's all I run on my boat. My Daiwa Saltis are high speeds. They're six two to ones, and they smoke if you want them to. If you really want to get on a fish, you can get on them pretty hard. Here's what I think about when it comes to high speed versus low speed is for divers. You can make you can make a high speed reel act like a low speed reel just by cranking it slower. But it's very difficult to make a low speed reel act like a high speed reel, unless you are really motorboating that thing. Hope you understand what I mean by that. You can make a high speed reel, crank nice and slow, stay nice and smooth and steady on the fish. And if that fish charges at the boat, especially if it's dragging around a diver and a flasher fly or a meat rig or something, sometimes you really gotta get on the reel and suck up that slack. So. I love my high-speed reels for my divers. <coughs> I've had hundreds of customers bring in fish on those things, too, with very, very, a very, very rarely ever have a problem as far as speed. Another place I think the high-speed divers really shine is when you're lake trout fishing, bouncing the bottom. Because there's, it's pretty common that I got 400-plus feet of line out there on my divers. And when you get a nice lake trout on there, and you just want to be nice and slow and steady with them, those high-speed reels are going to take up that slack much quicker, give you more control over the fish, and it's going to get that fish faster to the boat when you're fishing that much line. So <coughs> that's my <laughs> – Bob Hunter laughed at motorboating. Yeah, I, I kind of laughed inside my head too. Um, that's my thought on high-speed versus low-speed. If you do it a different way, you have a different way in your head of doing it, that's fine. I don't – I don't argue with anybody on that. When I talk about these things, this is always the way I do it. And there's a million different ways out there to do things. Okay. Let's talk about the rods that uh, I use and different possibilities out there. One of the most common rods used for wire divers, and we're going to talk about wire versus mono versus braid here in a moment. Well, one of the most common rods you're going to see out there are roller rods. And that's exactly what it is. It's roller guides inside these, these eyelets right here, which means there's an actual stainless steel roller in there. The rods that I prefer, I got away from roller, guide, roller rods a long time ago. I used to curse internally so, <laughs> so often if I was out there in the early early morning and I couldn't see because we didn't you know it's dark and um, shadows everywhere 
if a piece of my line or somehow my line would get trapped in between one of those rollers and the side or get kinked somehow up inside these eyelets, I would go nuts. <coughs> so frustrating. So when Okuma came out with uh, a stainless steel eyelet rod for wire divers, I jumped on it. And I'm glad that I did. So these are the Kuma Convector Pro wire rods. These are made specifically for wire divers. These have the big stainless steel eye guides all the way from the, you know, from the back all the way to the front. What I've seen in the past, and this must be new this year, is I've never seen that tip on these before. I'll show this to you. In the past, these would come with no, nothing on the end. Nothing as the final eyelet. And this year, it looks like they're actually putting one of these, I think these are AFCOs, one of these swivel, manipulative, you know, maneuverable tips, rather. So I don't know if that's better or worse. I've never used that, so I can't really make a comment on it. I love my twilly tips on the end of mine, and a twilly tip is nothing more than a great big spring right on the end of the rod. So that way, when you're fighting a fish, all that pressure isn't digging that wire into that final guide. I think this will probably be fine. But uh, without ever using one, I don't know. I'll have to look into that more. Length of rods for divers. 10 foot for your outside or high divers. 9 foot for your low or inside divers. And that's just what I use. And it's what most everybody around here uses as well. Uh, if you're thinking, hey, I'm on an 18 foot boat or I'm on a 17, 16 foot boat, 20 foot boat. You know, that, that rod seems awful darn big for my small boat. I used to run 16s and 17s and 18 foot boats, and I ran 10 foot dive rods and 9 foot dive rods, and they work wonderfully. You're going to want that extra, <clears throat> that extra length on that rod to help control all that gear that's trailing off a diver setup, it, as well as a big fish. It really comes in handy, and I highly recommend it. If you're sold on a 7 foot or an 8 foot rod, Feel free to go give it a try. Just uh, have it in the back of your head that other rods, hey kitty, there you found me. Um, other rod links might do might do a little better for you. There you are. You want to say hi to everybody? Okay. All right. Let's say hi to everyone. There he is. All right. There you go. Good seeing you. All right. So rods and reels, those are my preferred setups. Again, this is not set in stone in any way. If you got something out there that works well for you, have at it. I have no problem with that. And uh, we can still be friends. Don't worry. <coughs> long as we're talking about the rods and reels and setups, let's talk about mono versus braid versus wire, and what you're going to be putting on your reels. First off, mono, just don't even think about it. The mono on a diver setup is a nightmare, and it almost, hey there, kitty almost impossible to use um, in a productive manner. What happens with mono, because when you set those divers, there is so much so much force pulling out of that diver. That whole rod is going to be bent right over. Um, a lot of force there. When you go to trip that diver at the end of the day, or a fish hits it, and uh, many times it's not going to release, because that monofilament has so much stretch in it, unless you pre-stretch that mono, uh, it's just not going to trip for you. So you could have a giant king on the back end of that thing, and you're not able to trip that diver. Most time that fish is going to get off there. And like I said, at the end of the day, when you go to trip them yourself, you're going to have a hard time. I'm going to give you a little tip right here that I learned several years ago about how to trip your divers at the end of the day. Because I used to I used to grab my diver rod, you know, at the end of the day, you take it out of the rod holder, you give it a couple big yanks like that, and hope you trip your diver back there. Here's a pro tip for you. Point your rod right at your diver, pull straight back like that. It's gonna take that, it's gonna pop that diver so easy for you. In fact, most of the time, I'd say like 99% of the time, when one of my diver rods goes off and I grab it out of a holder and go to hand it to a customer, I almost, almost oh, 99% of the time, I will take that thing out of the rod holder, I'll give it a quick backwards pull to make sure that it did trip, and then I'll hand it over to a customer. And the reason I do that is I've done this and I've seen other boats do that. They think the diver is tripped and that fish 
is long gone and all they're doing is they're bringing that diver into the boat no fish on there there's actual one of the salmon showdown episodes um there's the actual video of a boat that thought they had a monster fish on there and they thought it was such a big fish they cleared every other line off the boat pulled every other line in and when they got that thing to the boat it was the diver just hadn't tripped the fish was long long gone so I've been there. I've seen other people do that, and it's a crappy feeling. It is a crappy feeling. Uh, I felt bad for those guys. But anyway, that's my tip. Point it right at it. Give it a straight pull back. You don't have to yank it. Just steady pressure back. It's going to trip your diver really, really easy for you. So <clears throat> mono, just don't do it. Just don't do it. The two most common ways to run divers are braid or wire. And both have their pros and both have their cons. Braid is no stretch, wire is no stretch. Braid will get you, it'll cut the water really, really nicely for you. Pick up a few more sea fleas out there. That's one of the cons to it. Um, but it's a good application. A lot of guys still run braid out there. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Wire cuts the water a little bit better, less sea fleas on it, and it puts a really nice hum in the water that uh, has been debated for a long, long time whether or not that, that hum that vibration is actually picked up by that fish's lateral lines and it brings fish into a spread. I have a tendency to agree with that. I think it does do that. And just based on I've seen wire up fish braid so frequently. So you're not going to go wrong really by running braid. But if you have the option, I would strongly recommend wire over braid. Now wire can be temperamental. It can get curly cues in it. It's going to get curly cues in it. That's just that cat just went screaming through here. Oh, what he's doing. Um, it's going to get curly cues in it. You're going to have to cut that thing back as the season goes. And as you do that, of course, you're going to get less and less line on there. And your, your reels might not have the same amount of line on them. And it's hard to run at the same depths when you don't know exactly what's on there. So like I said, there's pros and cons to braid versus wire. My preferred way is wire. But again, a lot of guys out there still run braid. I know some some uh, anglers that run braid high divers, wire low divers. And there's, like I said, there's a million different ways to do it. <clears throat> How much wire or braid are you going to put on your reel? My rule of thumb and what we do here at the shop when we spool up reels, a thousand feet. A thousand feet is what's going on to that reel. Now with my my uh, my reels being size 50, that thousand feet does not fill up my reel all the way. So what I have found, if you're going to a size 40 or 50 size reel, what I do is I take 50 pound monofilament and I put about 50 yards on before I put anything else on. Tie the wire to that, then spool that thousand feet on there and it gives me a really nice um, full spool of wire. You wanna to try to keep your reels equal as far as how much reel or how much line you have on there because if you're running say a high diver on port side at 300 feet and a high diver on starboard side at 300 feet if the line capacity is off you could be off several feet and not running in the same depth so just some things to keep in mind nobody said this stuff is easy except me i've said that a few times <laughs> All right, so a thousand feet of wire is a great place to start and then trim back or replace as needed as the season goes on. <coughs> a couple guys asked if uh, wire is going on sale soon. No, not as far as I know. Um, and Dan Canham, I agree with you. As a beginner, braid is a little easier to work with. It is. It's a little nicer animal, but uh, as you get more experience, or if you want to jump right in, wire is a great way to go as well. Pardon me, my nose is now running. Man. All right. So we talked about the rods, the reels, the capacities. We talked about what I like to run. Uh, we talked about a little tip on how to uh, trip your divers. Uh, we talked about divers and what they are. Let's get into setting these divers up and how I fish them. So... Like I said, what I got here is a 107 millimeter. This would typically be my high diver or outside diver. I also have 124 millimeter here, deeper diver from Dreamweaver. This is what I typically run as my low diver. <coughs> I 
There's your 124 millimeter compared to the 107. You see there's a significant size difference. Also a major size difference in the lead weight. That's what's back here in these pockets. The lead weight in the back end. So these are going to get you a little deeper than these. The bigger ones with the bigger weight, of course, is going to get you a little bit deeper. And typically you're running your low divers at a little bit deeper depth. So that's why I'm going to run those at my deeper depths. Color. Let's just... Let's just talk about color real quick. Anybody that's watched this channel for any length of time knows what color I prefer on my divers. That's that one right there. I run black, and that's all I run. It doesn't mean that uh, the clear or the chrome or the UV or the custom-painted colors from other places are not going to catch fish. This all boils down to confidence for me. This all boils down to years and years of catching fish on black divers, and that's instilled into my pea brain that black divers work. Okay, now if you have run clear divers for all your life and it works for you, you probably have that same thought process. You're thinking that you're thinking to yourself, well, this guy's a moron. Um, it boils down to what you have confidence in. If you're catching fish every day on a black diver or fish every day on a chrome diver, that's your system. What I, what I know, though, is black divers just have produced for me for a long, long time, and I trust them. I think, uh, I think some t I remember one time on Jim's boat, <coughs> we were fishing um, deeper divers, but he had UV tape on the top of that thing. We were bringing that thing up from the depths, and it looked like we were pulling the sun out of the water. It was so, so bright. So could... Over-reflection deter fish? Yeah, I think that's incredibly possible. Um, my thought process on the subdued colors is less is a little better. I think less things down there spooking that fish, um, you know, just having a nice subtle appearance in the water, I think that can pay dividends for you. So I've, I've gone to black, and uh, I wasn't going to say that stupid pun, but you understand what I'm saying. This is the way I go. <coughs> Both, both highs and lows. So that's why I run black. Snubbers. The next thing you're going to want on these things is a snubber. It goes on the back end. A snubber, or a ripcord, as Dreamweaver calls them, is nothing more than a shock absorber. These are the Dreamweaver ripcords. These are just twisted pieces of rubber, and they stretch. They take really nice, really nice jarring hits, and they stretch and come back to where they should. Lure Jensen makes something called just a snubber. Um, what it is is a, it's a elastic, almost like an elastic casing over a piece of wire or super line. And what that thing does, it will stretch so far until it reaches the, the maximum stretch of that super line inside and it won't stretch anymore. The problem I had with those is after a couple seasons with those, the outside sheathing wears down, it just wears out and they just become loose noodles. And basically you're pulling that thing through the water at its max stretch the entire day. These rip cords, I've used these things for two, three, four, five years without changing one, and they, they come back to life every single time. So these are my preferred snubber choice. My preferred snubber choice for salmon divers is black. I just go the same way, the same color as my divers. And the only reason I do that is because it tells me that those are my salmon divers because I also have divers on the boat that are dedicated to lake trout only, and those have different length leaders on them. So my, my trout divers have an orange uh, rip cord on them. So I can just look right down and I know exactly which one is which. I'm not grabbing the wrong one and realizing that I got the wrong length leader out there, which I've done. Um, so, stubborn. let's show you how this goes on there. That back barrel swivel. Got yourself a little swivel right there. Let's hook it on. All right. Let's go to leader. What do I run for leaders? And again, anybody that's watched this channel for any length of time knows that. Where are you? There you are. 50 pound big game or 50 pound suffix are it's my go-to leader material. Some people swear that you got to run fluorocarbon on this. I, I don't think so. Again, that's just my two pennies. Um, these are, or this is what I've used for many, many years. Many other charter captains have used for many, many years. Many tournament anglers used for many, many years. This stuff is just brutally strong, <coughs> and it works great. 
I apologize for the coughing. I feel like my nose is just draining like crazy. Anyway, uh, this is the way I, I set my leaders, my length of leaders. And, of course, this is going to go from the back of that snubber out to either a spoon, flash or fly, or a meat rig. So I'm six feet tall. I grab it at the end. I pull it out to an arm's length. Grab it where that was. Pull that out to an arm's length. Hold on. And then one more time, arm's length. So three poles, that's probably about 18 feet, 17 to 20 feet, somewhere in that range. I did not bring my scissors. Hold on. Now, somebody's out there asking right now, how in the heck do you net that thing if your leader is 18 feet long? And the answer to that is you got to hand line it. Hand lining is what I've been doing for many, many years, and I love doing it. I think it puts great control over the fish. I think it has a higher catch rate. But I know also it can be really difficult on a small boat. Uh, you got two, three guys at the back of the boat on a 16, 18-foot boat. It's a lot of weight back there. It's uh, It can be pretty cumbersome, but it is a great technique. So this is, just, again, the way that I do it doesn't mean it's the way that you have to do it. Experiment around, figure out what works really well for you. So, back of that snubber. I'm going to just tie a clinch knot back here. Or a polymer. You can do either one. Alright. Quick clinch knot. I like doing the double clinch, which is the double loop. I think it's a little stronger. If you don't know how to do a clinch knot, there's a million good videos out there on YouTube. Right there, I probably lost half a foot of line just by doing that. Because I've learned over the years that I don't like messing around with really short tag ends to try to cut those off or mess around with them. So my tag ends are always a little longer than normal. There we go. Diver, snubber, leader. And into my leader, I'm going to take a Dreamweaver DS6 ball bearing swivel. Ball bearing swivel is highly important here. You don't want to run just a barrel swivel with no ball bearings because you're going to get massive line twists. I'm dropping everything. So, polymer knot back here. Trim that tag in. And you got yourself a ready to go, fully functioning diver. Tom has to say, hand lining is fun when you're solo or with two guys without an autopilot. Yeah, Tom, I've been there. I, I understand. It can be pretty cumbersome, but it is a great way to keep control on the fish. I see somebody else mentioning slide divers. And I'll talk a little about slide divers here in just a sec. But <coughs> this is this is the nuts and bolts of a, of a uh, diver application right there. That's my low diver. My high diver is the exact same thing for salmon. 18 to 20 foot leader. Um, settings. So there's always a port side of the boat and there's always a starboard side of the boat. If this is going off the left side of the boat or the port side, there is a L and an R right there. Make sure you put it on the right side. Ask me how I know this. Ask me how I know that. Probably the same way that many others out there know that. Because if you put it on the wrong setting, those divers are going to crisscross at the back of the boat, and you're going to have a mess. So if it's port side, I'm going to take that on the left, switch it over to the left. My diver setting for my low diver is a setting number one, port side or starboard side, depending on which side of the boat you're going. 
My setting for my high divers is a setting number three. Okay, so how does that math work out? How do you know how deep these things are running? Now, the rule of thumb that I learned a long time ago, and it works pretty darn well, is if you're on a setting number one for your low diver, it's normally two to one. So if I let this thing out 100 feet on my line counter, I'm going to get about 50, foot of depth, 50 feet of depth. Um, if I let it out 200 feet, I'm going to get about 100 feet of depth, so two to one. On the high diver, that was low diver, on the high diver, on the setting number three, it's about three to one. So if I let it out 90 feet, I'm going to get about 30 feet of depth. If I let it out 300 feet, I'll get about 100 feet of depth. Okay, so that's the math, and there is a, I believe there is a dive chart. Yeah, there is. There is a dive chart on the deeper divers, comes with it. And uh, if you try to remember all that or memorize it, the good for you, I don't do that. I've always used that adage, two to one for my low divers, three to one for my high divers. And it's worked well for me over the years. So that's just a great place to start. <coughs> Excuse me. Setting the tension on the arm. So if you think about it, the line is coming down from the rod, connecting to the front of your diver. So you connect it to your arm right there. You close that, locks it in place, that makes it plain through the water and achieve depth. So where do you want to set the setting on that arm right there? There's no there's no real magical way to do this. It, it's trial and error because every diver has a little different tension uh, to it. A little more, a little less. So you're going to have to play around with that thing. But typically for me, once I lock that thing in place, if I take my finger underneath there... That one's really loose. But if I take my finger underneath there and give it tension, and just a little tension, all of a sudden she'll pop open. That's my starting point normally. Uh, if it's too loose, you're going to let it out, and it's going to trip on you and trip on you and trip on you. If you set it too tight, you could, you're going to get fish biting on there, and it's not going to trip, or you're going to have to trip it yourself. You want to find that happy medium somewhere where a fish aggressively grabs that thing. It's tripping on its own. That way it's no longer planing and you're just bringing the diver in. Now, there is a guy I watch on YouTube sometime called No Fish Nick. I like the guy. He seems like a nice guy. I'd like to fish with him sometime. Um, he has a SWR Dipsy rig. And my first mate, Tim, has talked about this. He's tried it. I've never tried it. And I'm not going to really get into it because I can't describe it as well as anybody else or somebody else could. But essentially, it's a way to have as long of a leader that you want because you're actually, once that dipsy trips or the diver trips, you bring that in, you're actually taking it right off the line and then just fighting the fish. It's an interesting concept. I, I see I see there'd be some flaws in it in my mind, but I also see there'd be some great benefits to it. So without ever trying it, I really can't comment if it's great or it sucks. Um, I, it looks like it could work, though. Uh, where do I want to go from here? So, we talked about the setup. We talked about the settings. We talked about which diver goes where. Uh, we talked about the snubbers. Highly, highly important. There's some guys out there that say, I never use a snubber. And I, I swear by these things because if I do get a customer, or anybody really for that matter, on the boat that gets a little over aggressive, and wants to do a Kevin Van Dam hook set onto a, on a diver setup, if you don't have a snubber on there, that hook is most likely, either, or the, the lure is either going to get broken off or it's going to get ripped out of that fish's mouth. So the snubber on there can really save your bacon. Settings, colors, tension, setup, snubber, line 50 pound, Dreamweaver DS6 swivel on the back end, ball bearing. What do we run on these things? You can run anything you want on these things from flash or fly, which we just talked about last week, to meat rigs, to spoons. And Tim last year, my first mate, uh, he really experimented quite often with running spoons on his high diver with great success. I was impressed with his catch rate on those high divers. <coughs> so if you're wondering, well, if you got 50 pound big game on there, do I really want to be running a spoon? A 50-pound big game with a giant swivel. 
no, you really don't. So what we were doing on our boat, and this is a technique I've used for a while, we were taking our sliders, our free sliders that we normally would put onto our downriggers, which is a six foot long piece of 25 pound uh, monofilament normally, with uh, smaller swivels on both ends. And we're just hooking that right onto that swivel, six feet away, we're putting that spoon on there. And we had really good success on there, uh, running spoons on these things. Seem to work much, much better um, on your high dive or on his high divers than it did on the low divers. I tried it a few ways, and yeah, the high divers seem to be a little bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Meat rigs, of course, can be run on these things. My typical, my typical setup for the morning is if I want to run a meat rig on a diver, it's almost always on my low diver. Flash or fly on my high diver. In fact, that's the way I was setting things up for. I've been setting it up that way for a long, long, long time. Meat rigs on low diver or flash or fly on a low diver, flash or fly on a high diver. Now, I know a few boats out there that do it the opposite way. And again, this comes down to Chevy versus Ford versus Dodge. If you trust in the way you're doing it, you have confidence in the way you're doing it, there's no reason to change if, if it's working for you. So, again, that's just the way I've been doing it, and it's the way yeah, I trust it. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. One thing I didn't mention, I see some questions on here, is what braid might you be running on your divers? Uh, most time when we set them up here in the shop, it's 50 or 65. So that's the way we normally do it. The uh, the wire, you, got, you probably heard me kind of bemoan this before. The wire that I recommend, I like torpedo wire on these things. If I'm putting wire on, that's normally what I'm putting on. I've come to trust uh, torpedo over the years. I've used, well, I've used Blood Run right there on my shirt. Had several breakoffs on that. I've used Morgan's. That was last year, and I probably lost eight or nine expensive rigs and fish by Morgan's breaking on me. I still say Morgan's owes me about 800 bucks. Um, I've used Mason. Mason was decent. Uh, I didn't really have a whole lot of problems with Mason. It seemed to curly cue a little more. And I've used uh, Torpedo, like I said. I like the Torpedo, whether you get it in the seventh strand or uh, i trying to think what the other option is. is it, it might be a 30 strand. Um, it's a 30 pound wire, but the breaking strength is much higher than that. And Torpedo actually has some nice videos out showing their wire versus other brands of wire, and their breaking strength is always higher, which is good. It's a good thing. <clears throat> so those are the two pound tests that I would recommend on your divers. I apologize. I'm going to go blow my... I'll be right back. All right, thanks for that. All right, so that gets us into the ballpark. Now we're we're out there fishing with the divers, we're out there fishing with our meat rigs, or our flash or pie, or our spoons, and spoons are a great way to go. Um, speed, what are we gonna run on our speeds for our divers? So you get kind of an idea when you look at your divers. What If you're running a fish hawk, that is the way, or the, the, the most, the highest recommended way that I can tell you to do things, running a Fishhawk probe on one of your downriggers gives you your speed, not over ground, but at the probe, down at the ball where the depths are, you know, where the different currents are. If you don't have a Fishhawk probe or a depth rater or something like that, you start to, you start to, when you look at your divers, you start going, that is way too much bend in that one, that is way too little bend in that one. You know, you're starting to get some cross currents in some ways. You like to have your divers pulling equally off the back of the boat. And you'll know after a while by looking at them going, that is way too much. That is way too much. I'm going to slow the boat down a little. Or that is way too little, way too little. I'm going to speed the boat up a little. And every boat fishes differently. And every diver rod fishes differently. But you'll start to figure, you'll start tuning in after a while on what your speed is, what your best speed might be. And of course, listen to the fish. If you're getting bit at 2.7 miles an hour speed over ground, don't change a thing. If you're getting bit at uh, 2.1, don't change a thing. But it's a good idea to start when you're running your divers to start looking at them and figuring out in your head 
uh, you'll start getting that sixth sense, like that's screwed up. I need to do something because I'm not getting bit and that's garbage. So I would say like every now and then on my boat, if we're fishing and even if we're getting bit, um, if the bite dies off or whatnot, I, I'll say this is a garbage troll and I can just feel it. I can feel it in my brain. I can feel it in my heart. And I go, nah, we got to change something here because you get tuned in your boat and you can look at things. You can just feel things. You can not nah, nah, this is wrong. I'm going to make a change here. And, uh, luckily sometimes I'm right, but, um, yeah, you'll start figuring those things out the more you do it. That's why I always say <clears throat> you can watch all the YouTube videos you want. Please do watch all mine, please. Um, but until you really start going out there and, uh, and you read the books, watch the videos, listen to the podcast, it's all great, great uh, information. But get out there on the water and start doing these things. And that is really the tool that's going to teach you the most. So try to think of anything else I really want to talk about. We've covered divers really from front to back. Uh, we've covered uh, presentations, wire versus braid, settings, colors, you name it. Let's uh, open up some question time here. We've been talking, or I've been talking rather, for how long have I been talking? A while. That's all I know. It's been a while. Let's open up some chat and answer some questions. I appreciate everybody that has been asking questions and uh, people on here answering as I'm just yapping away. So Joe Wilbom, I, I kind of covered that. You're asking how far back do I run the spoons versus flash or fly. So flash or fly is running at 18 feet. That's the length of my leader. With a spoon adding that six-foot slide leader on there, you're looking at now 24 feet or somewhere in that range. So uh, that's that's about how far back you run them. Depth-wise, it's going to be different every day, man. Um, you're going to have to figure out where the fish are feeding, where they are likely going to be feeding, where they might be moving to, and that's going to be the depths you want to run those in. Jason C. is saying you run uh, shorter leaders with spoons, longer with flash or fly. Yeah. Again, there's no wrong way to do it. Brian Waters wants to know any deals on fish hawk at Tangle Tackle. Uh, I haven't heard of any yet. I'll let you know though if there are. Just ducking back in here and uh, reading some of the previous comments. Don't leave the dock without a fish hawk, says Tom S. I, I agree with you, Tom. Oh, slide divers. I want to cover some uh, information on that real. Yeah, thanks, Steve S. for reminding me. So slide divers. Slide divers are a great tool. Um, you can get the oversized rings and the larger weights to get the deeper depths. that You're, you're going to need those tools to, to really get down to the deeper depths. And that's where these deeper divers from Dreamweaver really outshine a slide diver. They're more consistent at deeper depths, and I think they outproduce slide divers at a higher rate at deeper depths. Now, slide divers, I run the heck out of when I'm shoreline fishing or if I'm pierhead fishing or really shallower fishing. That's when my slide divers really, really come to life. I have a video on this channel showing you everything about slide divers. I'll show you how to store things. I'll show you how to set things up. It's a complete video on there. For me, slide divers, though, are more of a shallow water application. And I know some boats out there, they run them all year round. And more power to you. There's nothing wrong with that. If they're producing for you, that's wonderful. I'm going to go with, again, with what I'm confident in, and that's the Dreamweaver Deeper Divers. <coughs> oh, I was going to show you how I store these things. I apologize. I'll do that real quick. So, end of the day, you're done. You want to put these things away without the line being all over the back of the boat. I'm going to show you exactly how I do it. You open up the arm. You grab the line, oh, about a half foot or so behind your snubber. You're going to put that line right in between where the arm is and that uh, catches. And you got to run that along through there. All right. You notice I got my left thumb over here. I'm holding that line against the diver. Now I'm going to take that line. I'm going to go right back and I'm going to pick up that S clip. You see how I'm coming under that S clip? That's going to keep that line right in place. And now I'm just going to start wrapping that thing right around through there. 
this is the way I've been doing this. I've been doing this for a long time. This was shown to me by uh, Paul Schlafly of Riverside Chargers a long time ago. I used to do it all sorts of different ways. I used to run it back and forth the other way. I've tried using swim noodles on both sides, wrapping around swim noodles. This to me is the fastest and the easiest, most economical way. There's also things out there like the, uh, I forget what that thing's called. It's a, uh, almost like a big piece of sponge you put on your rod and there's a place for the diver and a place for your lure. Those things are kind of slick. We've tried those before. But for me, this is just easy. So I'm gonna wrap that, keep wrapping that all the way around there. So you can see that line is wrapped all the way around there. And now, as I get to the top, I'm just gonna take that, go right around that top, gonna close that arm, if that was tight enough. And that arm keeps everything right in place. I'll set that in my tray or wherever I want, and it's good to go. It stays there for me. <coughs> James Johnson, yes, I did say I ran a six-foot slider off my diver lines. That's exactly what I said. Leadermate, yeah, Captain Crow, thank you, man. Yep, Leadermate. I think it's made by Lunacy. Yeah. Yep, and Jeff Kinney, you're right. You can run slide divers on wire. It's not a system that I use, but yeah, you can definitely do it. There are, there are videos out there showing you how. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Not seeing a whole lot of more questions come in, so we can start shutting this thing down. We can uh, shut down the visual aspect of this and just jump into the chat as the credits roll. We can talk there more. But I did want to take a moment here to say thank you to everybody for being here tonight, all the new members, all the people that have been here a long, long time. I do appreciate it. It's because of all of you and all your support that make these things happen. And I'm really looking forward to spring coming here pretty darn soon. It's, the, it's about time to start getting the boat out, you know, definitely. All right. I'm going to roll this thing into the end credits. And we are going to uh, just talk for a while in the chat. Stick around. If you've got questions you want answered, I'm happy to help you out. Otherwise, I will see everybody next Sunday, 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have another great discussion, another great chat, probably another topic. And, uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, just hang out for a while. All right. Thanks, everybody. You are the best. I do appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Thank <clears throat> you.